Originally, I was going to sort of run this like a phone art class and sort of ask, or in fact, dictate that everybody did um, their notes via Twitter. And at the end, we aggregated and storified everybody's notes to make a meta set of notes. But of course, in a phone art class, the class, you know, we rely on a bigger, a bigger meta class to add in. And there really isn't the sort of, I don't know, are, are, are we broadcasting on radio? Is anybody actually listening in? Mikhail? One second, <laughs> anyway. If you want to, we could do that, especially if people never use Twitter to teach, because I'm going to do three things. I'm going to do a, a short talk, then I'm going to look, I'm going to pick apart the phonar class, just go through it very quickly, and then I'm going to, then I said it originally when we, we all introduced ourselves, I'm going to show a third thing that I'm hoping that you're going to help me to, to break, take apart before, um, before, we, before we do anything else with it. So there are three things. Um, I, uh, in, you know, uh, cards on the table. I've been completely terrified about um, speaking to you lot since, right since this um, began, since um, Howard and Mimi asked me to be involved. And I've kind of thought myself into an impasse, really, about what to, to talk about. I had a sort of grand narrative of phonar, but then it occurred to me that most of the people in here probably know it already, or you may have seen some of it, and then it would be really boring. So I thought, well, that isn't really what I should be doing. So Gardner said yesterday, <coughs> um, A, he was looking forward to hearing me talk, which is, again, terrifying, and then <laughs> B, that I should just talk about what I think is most urgent. And so there is, there is sort of one thing that I, I really think I can't stop not thinking about, and it's the thing that's informing everything that I do. And as I look back at the, at the, the sort of key learning moments, then it, it is the thing. It is the thing that has driven me. And now, I'm also going to have to talk in response to how Mike framed us all. So we're all doing that, and thank you for Mike for that. So I, I pitched it in as a why. I have two whys that I started out with. One that was very, um, it was very important. It was the reason why I, I'll, have to, I'll tell you, talk about it in a minute. I have two whys. What are you going to do? So I have two whys, and I'll, I'll talk about those. But I'm going to talk about... Trust. So if I have one takeaway question, I thought, well, what is the thing? One takeaway question, it's sort of in today's sort of quantum learning environments, how do we propagate and sustain interest-driven learning? That is, my, that is my sort of thing that I think about a lot. I'm going to jump around. So Tracy walked into the children's house of fun to pick up her children, and she was clearly upset. She was clearly in shock. She was crying. And I, you know, I was there, I was looking after the kids, and I thought... I was, I was trying to get away, um, <coughs> and she walked in and she said, my, my dad's had a stroke. I was like, oh, that was difficult to deal with. So this is my why, as I said, I'm going to jump around. This is my most recent why, and this is sort of driving everything. How, how many people here have already seen this picture? If you've heard me talk, you may have seen this, you may not. Who's seen this picture? Quick show of hands. Of course, Jim has. Yes, some of you have. What is this? Um, so this picture, this is my why right now. Um, and I'm going to talk about that. I'm talk about that at the end. That's my answer for for Mike's why. So I'll talk about now about Bernard Timpson. <coughs> so this is Bernard. Um, Bernard, uh, Lord. Um, this is Bernard lives in the Midlands. Um, he lives a couple of miles away from where I live. And so he had a he worked his whole life as um as in in industry in a factory putting cars together. And at the weekends he would sell shoes. Now. It's a bit woolly how this all sort of started, but there, at some point he made friends with a family business in Northamptonshire in the UK, and they started supplying him these, these boots, these shoes. And he'd sell them, at night he'd sell them after the pub, he'd sell them for his garage, and in the weekends he'd sell them at the, um, at the market. Now, these boots were, they were, they were useful because they were useful in the factory. They had a sole that um, was chemically resistant, and they had an air cushion. <coughs> now, one day when I was just sort of starting out um, with the classes, Bernard had a stroke and had a car accident. <coughs> and so he, he woke up, and he woke up on one side of his body wouldn't work, and the other side was obviously sort of been hit by a car, and that was sort of crushed. So it was very difficult for, for Bernard. So now I want to talk about this, this photographer. So... You may have seen me talk about my photography before, and this, there was a key moment in my, my business as a photographer. Um, 
where I had to rethink exactly what it was that I did. I used to think my product was photographs. I used to supply these photographs to magazines and newspapers. And, and my business was pretty solid. And I was a relatively successful photographer. You know, I had a studio in New York. I'd worked in London. I was working for these uh, newspapers and magazines. But with digital, with digital, my business model had to change quite fundamentally. You know, as it was, people, I realized in retrospect that people used to pay for the mode of delivery, never the mode of information. People used to buy the magazines and newspapers. They never actually bought my photography. I never let them buy my photography. Now, when, when, the mode of, when people stopped paying for the mode of delivery, i.e. digital, the internet, people, my business model collapsed. Now, at this point, I had an economics 1.0 head on, and what I was seeing there was I was seeing that my images were suddenly abundant. My photographs were abundant, and I couldn't, I couldn't make the supply of my images scarce in order to control the price. And so what I would do is I would go online and I would hunt down where these images were. And this is, this is the, sort of the, the sort of key moment for me, that <coughs> light bulb moment, where after a shoot with Heath Ledger, um, his, his image was everywhere. And I hunted down the one where they seemed to be coming from, and I sort of attacked this person. I attacked this person and sort of said that they were stealing my stuff, that, um, that you know, they, they, they was, this was morally wrong, it was ethically wrong, you know, you wouldn't steal my car. And so I, I brought everything that I could try to understand this moment to this to this what turned out was a 14 year old girl who was just a huge Heath Ledger fan and so you know I, I never wanted to be that person we had tears she was crying I got two you know, emails backwards and forwards and so I started to send her stuff I apologized I sent her I sent her my outtakes so as a photographer this is my gold dust this is the stuff that I would make money on just to be clear how broken my business model is. When I shoot a, a cover for the New York Times, I get paid $250 all in, no matter how famous they are. So I don't make money on the shoot. So what I make money on is reselling the pictures afterwards, and I've just given these away. So um, you know, I felt better about this. I, this was a point at which I couldn't... I didn't know where I was going to go at this point, so I'm retrofitting a narrative to this. But... Um, and something sort of had to change. Now, what I noticed at this point is that I started to get a lot of traffic to my blog. Now, this talk is about trust. It turned out that she wasn't any 14-year-old girl. She was, she was the go-to girl for Heath Ledger. She, her website wasn't just a blog, it was a hub. It was where you went to to find all the best stuff on Heath Ledger, where the newest stuff was, where the outtakes were. Now, it, I'd reinforced this whole thing. And what she'd done is she pointed at me and said that I was credible and that I was trusted and that you should go and see this stuff from Jonathan. I didn't know how to capitalise on this. I'm still not selling my pictures at this point. I'm just moaning that my business model is crashing. So I'm going to talk about a writer now. So lots of you will know who this is and some of you may know this story. But, um, but I, was, I was commissioned to photograph this guy. This guy's Corey Doctorow. He's a science fiction author. I was commissioned to photograph him for Popular Science magazine. Um, I did this, and then two years after photographing him, I had made no money whatsoever syndicating the images, the traditional way of doing it, syndicating it. And uh, I, I, was, I remained friendly with Corey, and he was, uh, you know, I was seeing what he was doing, and it was like, dude, you are giving your books away for free, and yet you are making money from it. And... Look, I am also apparently giving all my stuff away for free, unintentionally, but not making money from it. How can I do this? How can I do something about this? And so we devised this little trial. We devised this little trial, and we, this, this image, we put it online. It's a meter by a meter. You can still download this image for free. And then I printed out 111 images and signed the back of them all. And Corey gave me every page from a photocopied manuscript and he signed every page, and we put them together. And we numbered these pages. Now, bearing in mind that each of these images numbered is exactly the same, and that you can down a high, download a high-res version for free, we put them on, on market, we put them on sale. Now, again, this has been well documented, and, and lots of you probably already know about it. The takeaway from this is not the fact that all of the cheap ones went, and that there was a fight for the most expensive one, and that one person bought most of two to six, that was interesting in itself. The key takeaway at this point 
is that how on earth would I have reached those people had Corey not directed them to me? Had he not said to the people that were most interested in him and his product, Jonathan Worth is credible and, and, and tr you can trust him. These are of me, this is my manuscript, and this is how you're going to buy it. He pointed them at me and he made me credible on that moment. So I'm going to talk a little bit about class now. I, said, I promised I'd jump around. So I'm a photographer. Photography is going through a second paradigm shift. Teaching is going through a paradigm shift. Of course, lots of things are. The first paradigm shift for photography was when it broke away from painting. It became a medium in its own, in its own right. Currently, well, when it became a medium in its own right, and the photograph, look at what photography does. You know, photography makes an artifact. It makes an artifact, and this artifact was used to prove something. It's, it, it means for the last 100 years, seeing was believing, and photography really sort of reinforced that, proved it, if anything. This next paradigm shift, the image is breaking away from the photograph. We're still using the same language to describe these things, and this is very, very confusing. As Mark McGuire says, and I repeat it endlessly, if you want to start, if you want to change the world, we have to start describing it differently. So I try now to talk about images. The image is not about evidence. The image is about experience. It's experiential. Snapchat is a great example of this. Snapchat is a piece of software, as we know, where we send an image to somebody else, and it vaporizes very quickly. That's anathema to a photographer. I have all of my images. I own them. They're in boxes. They're logged. I know exactly where they are. I can go and get them. This is not, this is not what I do. So how, how, do I, how do I teach that? How do I teach it when there is an abundant supply of images? How, how, do, I, how, do, I, how do I teach this practice? I'm going to talk about that a little bit more in the class. But the takeaway from this moment is the problem... The issue is no longer seeing is believing. When this many people are making images, when there is this many supply of narratives, the issue is you have to be believed in order to be heard. You have to be believed in order to be seen as a photographer. How do we get believed? How do we get trusted? This, this is the issue. So my first class is trying to deal with all these things. The first class was called PicBod, Picturing the Body. And it dealt with, it dealt with, essentially what it dealt with was, what can I do that a, di that a mobile phone can't do? There must be something I can do as a craftsman, as an, as, art, as an artisan. Just an aside, somebody talked yesterday about mentoring, how do we bring other people on? I did the first class on my own, and then um, my teaching assistant back then, Max Johnston, he, he came on, started to work with me, and everything that I did was turned, it, it went 200% faster, and we went, 200% further. I handed this class over to him, which was a very painful moment. I became very attached. I've only got two classes in the entire degree that I actually wrote. They're both small classes, not worth many credits. <coughs> but handing this over to him was, um, was very difficult. I've, this is, last night was the first time I've looked at this class since he's been teaching it. And it was great. It was great to see a lot of my old lectures in there, a lot of the tasks in there that I set. And it was great to see that <coughs> he's not using Twitter so much. He's, um, he's gone on to um, Google Plus, and he's using that. It was, and it has currently 279 members. It's not running at the moment, which is great. These people are sort of still active. So the pic board was about, picturing the body was about what your mobile phone can't, what you can't do. So that was about building an artifact. The students went on to spontaneously um, produce an exhibition. This is in their second year, and it's a really big deal to do that as a second year. Hire a space, fill it with stuff, and fill it with people. Phonar, photography and narrative, well, that tried to do the other two things that I could see were like the three, three things I needed to understand as a, as a visual storyteller. One, I need to be able to make something that you couldn't make with, an, with a mobile phone. I, need to make, I could make a print that lasts 200 years, for instance. Number two, I needed to be trusted and credible. And number three, I needed to be heard. I needed to be a publisher. But not a publisher in the old sense. I need to, I need to reach out to people directly. <coughs> so I didn't know how to teach that. I, put the, I open sourced the problem. I asked everybody else, how can I teach this? I wasn't a teacher at this point. It's important to point out. You know, I'd never taught a class before. And so it was, for me, it was, seemed natural to put this on the blog and ask, how do I teach this? And not only how do I teach this, but what do I teach? I know what the problem is. I have a very, very clear why. 
my old job doesn't exist. The course that I learned, I cannot teach. It's inappropriate. So my, I had a clear why, I just didn't know how. Now, when I did put this online, the nine people in the room, this was the first year the course had run, and there were only nine students, and um, everybody who applied had been accepted because they only advertised the course in the local newspaper. Nine people turned to 900. That was in 10 weeks on a blog. There were 900 people that really wanted to know how to teach this stuff, what should we be teaching. 20 weeks later, there were just shy of 10,000. And 30 weeks later, there were, there were 35,000 people who were, who were all, who had dropped by to work this stuff out. Now, for that many people, the class changed. And I saw Gardner yesterday put up one of, I was really delighted to see one of Martin Hawkes' Twitter visualizations. This has changed the way that I understand the class that I teach. And so now, my classes, yes, they're still about this, um, doing something that can't be done on the internet, being trusted, being um, believed, and then being heard, they're also about but they're also about locating oneself on the internet. So what Martin said here, I thought this was brilliant, open courses can be quite solitary experiences, but visualizing networks can help to show participants how their conversations connect to the community, providing opportunities for situation awareness. What I heard when I read that was, this is how you can locate yourself within the network and be empowered by it, rather than being anonymized by it. <coughs> Five years later, the course is number one in the country. It's also the youngest course on this list from the Guardian um, newspaper. And it's notici noticeably the only course on there that has open classes. It's also the only course that the university that I teach at that has open classes. So, back to the shoe seller. So, Bernard had got this um, weekly delivery of shoes that were arriving at his house. These boots. And after his after his accident, his, Tracy, who is not a student of mine, this, none of this has been about students so far. She's a neighbour. She came to me and she said, um, you know, I need you to help me. And uh, I've got a mounting, and she said, at this point she had a, a, almost a warehouse, she had garages, full, almost a warehouse full of shoes that she couldn't sell on eBay at £35 a pair. <coughs> and so I you know, I said, well, you don't want me to photograph them. Christ, you know, her husband is a photographer. This is how we know each other, right? So, uh, no, no, I, I want you to do what you did for the class. How did you do that? I said, I, I don't know. I mean, you know, it's a photography class. What is, tell me this, what is the story with the boot? So my dad got these boots. It's from this company down in Northamptonshire, and it has this air cushion sole on it. Now, the story is that when he started to do this, there were two companies, one across the road from the other. And the company that he, he got these shoes from, a family-run company, had perfected this sole, but they weren't very good at putting the tops on the boots. Now, there was a company over the road that was very good with the tops of the boots, but they weren't very good at the sole. So the company over the road bought the company with the sole. When they bought it, they had one person they were supplying to on a weekly basis. And they had a really close relationship with Bernard, and so they, made, they wrote into the contract that Bernard would continue to receive these boots as long as he wanted them, which he did. Now, <coughs> this boot company was, was, a, was the one that, that Bernard was working with, that was I think called Air Cushion Boots, or yeah, I think it was or Soul of Air, Soul of Air, this is it. The company across the road was called Dr. Martins. So I said, so hold on a minute. So, so you're telling me that you've got a single supply of the original Doc Martin boots which are made on the original machines at the original factory, still being made by the original workers that made them when they were made in the UK, because they're all made in China now. She says, yes. I said, yes, I can help you. You can do something that can't be done on the internet. It can't be reproduced digitally. You have something there that is um, unique, generative, has to, be, has to be built. What you need to do is you need to be trusted and you need to be heard. So the first thing we're going to do is work on getting you trusted. Tell me about the boots. So she tells me about the boots. Now it turns out that hanging around her dad, she's got this collateral knowledge that she was completely unaware of. She knows the difference between ox blood and cherry red. She knows how many stitches there should be that go around the sole of the boots, which laces go on, which boots, the original, when they were first worn. So we began to unpick. So who is going to value this information? Fashion. Students love it. Music. Of course, there's a big music scene that, fo that follows it. Films. Politics. Um, the far right in the UK, you know, there's National Front 
proud they wear it. And any sort of macho culture gets quickly adopted by a gay culture. So there's a big gay scene that wear these boots as well. How do we tap into all of these? Where are the fish swimming? So I said, what you do is you go onto the blogs, and the only condition is you're not allowed to sell shoes. You just go on there and you talk about shoes. She did this for six months, and for those six months, her husband built a website. I said, the website has to be, we agreed, the website had to be red, white, and blue. It had to draw on all that culture. It had to draw on all those references. Cut, to cut a long story short, um, 12 months later, it was £145 a pair for the boots, and there was a 12-week wait. She couldn't get them enough. She couldn't get them fast enough. <laughs> Two years from then, the company bought her company as their sole distributor. She now works for them as a distributor. So we looked a little bit a minute ago. This is back to the class. So this is what the class looks like. This is Martin Hawkes' um, Twitter sphere, Twitter visualization again. The thing that really... Like the Death Star. <laughs> it is the Death Star. He is the Death Star. That's your <laughs> so, so when I show this to the students, and, and we, sort of, we talk about sort of locating yourself within the network, um, you know, I say, you know, what, what do you think this thing is here? Then? What is this thing? And of course, they begin to pick themselves, and they find their names in it. You know, that's a room on the ground floor at the back of a converted cinema in Coventry. That's the class. That's the class. At the center of this network, where all these people swim around it, but most of the people that are in the class are not in the class. So how do we reach those people? Everything so far has been about the people in the class. That network was awesome. This augments their, um, their experience. It internationalizes it. It enriches it. It amplifies everything they do and say, for better and for worse. But what about them? Most of my students, it turns out, weren't in the room. And I began to build really close relationships with a number of them. I had a a group of single moms in the north of England that were never going to go to college. They had kids way too early. They were never going to go. And the tragic thing was they thought they, didn't, they couldn't go. They wouldn't be able to. The reality was, of course, as you can imagine, they brought a whole new level of conversation. One of them was a particularly good photographer. But they, they brought a whole new level of conversation to the, to the class conversation. But I was failing them. <coughs> so this is a second project for the three. This moves out into the meta class. This is aimed at, this summer it's aimed at at-risk children, at-risk youth, 12 to 17 in America. But the, what's interesting, I think, about this class is that, it, as far as I'm aware, it's the first class that's been built on a mobile, for a mobile user, for a mobile teacher, to, with, to a mobile user, to a mobile audience. You know, I, I don't think the majority world are going to be accessing the internet by a, a laptop, by a desktops that are hooked into cables. I think this speaks to that meta class. This is the third this is the third step in that project. The class moved out beyond the classroom. Then the class moves out into the meta class. Now in the first one we were looking to build a network for the students or so a network happened. The second one is looking to actually sort of think about the Think about moving out into that network a little bit more, but still have the class as a reference point. What happens when we take a really thriving network, an established network, a trusted network, and we infiltrate it with our class content and with, with our teaching? So for those of you that aren't aware of the world press, it's like the Pulitzer Prize for photography. These are, these are some win winning images, the first woman of color to go to college, obviously images of Tiananmen Square and so on. And people who, who for whatever reason, can't go to school. This network has 11 million people coming to its show every year. It's had an academy since the 1990s, but it only taught eight people at a time. And it ran it like a competition. When I put phone eye in front of them and said, actually, it's not going to cost you any more. And if your raison d'etre is, in fact, to put something back, to sort of generally raise the bar of, of citizen journalism, then it won't cost you any more. And you can turn eight into eight million and more. So this class now runs on, for the first time this year, it runs on Facebook. So anyone can do this class. And it, these are the best photographers in the world. And you can not only go and listen to their lectures, you can talk to them and submit your work. At the end of this course, which ran in North Africa, they, they, picked, they picked winning, winning um, students from the people in the class, but also from people outside of the class. Now, 
this again speaks to this idea of trust. And I think, again, this was the most interesting part of this, and it's the part we're going to take forward next year when we work on this project again. How do you build trust in communities where trust is face-to-face, -face, it's a handshake or it's a kiss or it's a hug, when you've only got the internet? So I'm thinking this is North Africa, these are largely Arab countries. So we first started to investigate that. I look back at Corey. What, what, what was Corey? He, he, he was kind of trusted. And there's this thing called transitive trust. You know, you can, you can borrow from other people's trust, trust by proxy. Looked at, um, <coughs> looked at the Heath Ledger moment, the 14-year-old girl who pointed her trust at me, and I borrowed from it. So we said, right, who are the cultural influencers here? Who are the people within these communities that we should draw into this, but draw into the process of building it, not sell the product, draw into the process of building it. And you know, who knew that it was graffiti artists in Egypt, and it was poets in Algeria, and it's street artists in Tunisia, I think it was. So now we have this list of people, and we are drawing those people in to the next phase of this project. So this brings me back to, this is my why. So this image is the winning image from the World Press Photo this year. It's by a photographer called John Stanmayer, and this is why it annoys me so much because it's by a photographer called John Stanmere. These are, um, these are African immigrants standing on a beach trying to get a phone signal before they jump in the water. A free phone signal from, let me just get that right, on the shore of Djibouti city at night, raising their phones in an attempt to capture an inexpensive signal from neighboring Somalia. <coughs> these are the people that aren't in my class. They're holding up smart devices that can all take pictures. And yet it takes a photographer from New York to bring it back and make this image so that we can now talk about it. What these people need is to be able to be trusted and to be heard. And these are the people that aren't in the class. So this is my why. And this is my way marker. So <coughs> this is definitely the best and most exciting thing <coughs> that's come out of my classes. And all of the open classes since whatever it was, 2009. I mean, it's not that good. You know, there's loads of better stuff on Jim's classes or uh, dedicated multimedia courses. Sounds a bit rough, I suppose. But this was done in response to week two task in Phonar. And it was done by a 16-year-old girl on a mobile phone with a flashlight and a torch. That's all I've got to say about that.